Hello everybody, my name is Dick Coughlin, welcome to the Brother Neuro channel. Now, I realise that I've been doing this YouTube thing for quite a while, and I do realise that I have a certain number of people in my subscriber base who are hardcore fans, who have been there since the very beginning. Utter fucking losers, the lot of us. But, however, since this channel represents the fifth attempt at me rebooting my YouTube uh, career, I figured there's going to be a lot of people who are going to show up to this channel, or a lot of people who are watching already, who haven't been here for very long and don't know me very well. So, now, what I've just said there is my attempt to try and spin this video into something kind of, you know, productive or valuable. What this video really is, is just an attempt for me to draw out unnecessarily into a possibly episodic series, something that a tantamounts to me just sitting here jerking off on camera. This is going to be self-indulgence to a level that would make the amazing atheist blush. Now, as you can probably tell from the title of the video, I don't know why I'm pointing up there, because that's how long I've been on here. Most of the time the title's been there, but the title's down there now. As you can probably tell from the title of this video, uh, this video is going to be about me. But please keep in mind that whilst this is only 20 facts about me, this was going to be 100. And I do have 100, uh, you know, bare minimum, but I figured it's going to be a bit long. I don't want to hit you with 100. So I thought I'd give this a whirl and see what you make of it. You tell me, if you want me to do another section, I can take it a little bit higher. So, as Macbeth said to Hamlet in Midsummer Night's Dream, let's get this bitch's baps out and shove her up the runway. My name's Dick Coughlin, and here are 20 facts about me. Number one, my full legal name is Richard James Harris. I changed my name to Richard Coughlin when I started doing stand-up comedy because I didn't want to have a name that was the same as a famous actor. And in fact, I was given the name Richard by my dad, whose middle name was Richard. Um, if my mum had named me, I would have been called Jason. Mm -hmm. Number two, I was born in North London, but I grew up in South East Kent. And believe it or not, my next door neighbour was Bob Geldof. Mm -hmm. Number three, my earliest memory is my mother washing me in the kitchen sink when I was a small child, right after she'd done the washing up. However, unfortunately, she hadn't fully cleaned the sink out properly, and as she put me in to the soapy water, I sat on a fork that was still left over from the washing up, and immediately I felt a massive prick in my ass and began crying. Make your own fucking joke. Mm -hmm. Number four, at the age of seven, I won an art competition in primary school that was actually sponsored by Cadbury's Milk Chocolate. I won this award for a painting I did that depicted a big group of birds swooping into a football match between Tottenham Hotspur Football Club and Liverpool FC and picking up the Tottenham players and flying away with them. This was a painting I made as a joke for my, me and my dad because when I was a kid, even though I didn't really watch football, I sort of liked Liverpool and my dad was a Spurs fan. Also, because of that painting, I got to go to the ceremony where they handed out the certificates and I met the then Education Minister, uh, Kenneth Baker and even had my picture taken with him. However, I'm not going to show anybody that because I don't want any picture out there that depicts me shaking hands with a member of the fucking Tory party. Number five. As a child, there were only ever two TV shows that I desperately wanted to be on, so much so that I actually wrote in multiple times to the TV stations in order to apply to go on them. These two TV shows were Rolf's Cartoon Club mm -hmm. and Jim will Fix It. Mm -hmm. Obviously I was never accepted to go on these shows and clearly looking back the reason for that is because I obviously wasn't sexy enough. Number six. As a child the first ever ambition or dream job that I had when I wanted to grow up was to actually be an animator because that's how much I enjoyed cartoons. However I don't have the discipline or attention span to do any more than a single image. Unfortunately the idea of doing 25 images per second, which is what you had to do back then because there was no computer software to do it for you, that never happened. 
Number seven, as I said, I was a huge fan of cartoons when I was growing up. I was particularly a big fan of the Warner Brothers cartoons. In particular, my all-time favourite cartoon character as a child was Daffy Duck. There was just something about him that I related to. Also, the other thing I liked about Daffy Duck is he hated Bugs Bunny. Because I hated Bugs Bunny. Because Bugs Bunny was a fucking arrogant prick. And I'm pretty sure, to this day, that Elmer Fudd never used to be a hunter. And he only ever wanted to shoot Bugs Bunny. He wasn't interested in shooting anything else. In fact, the first film that I ever cried at was that cartoon where Bugs Bunny deliberately kills that abominable snowman who's a bit simple but ultimately harmless, who just wanted to adopt him as a pet by literally making him melt in the sun on purpose. You fucking cunt. Number eight, the second film that made me cry as a child was E.T. The Extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. Number nine, as a child my parents had a very liberal attitude as to what they allowed me to watch that was, shall we say, not suitable for someone of my age. In fact, by the age of ten I had watched both Die Hard 1 and 2, Terminator, the Predator movies, Robocop, and every single film in the Halloween, Friday the 13th, and Nightmare on Elm Street franchises. I was even allowed to watch certain adult comedy films such as Trading Places, Animal House, and Coming to America. Number 10, however, life wasn't that easy for me because as a child there were two films, only two, that my parents would not allow me to watch. One of them was Goodfellas, apparently because it had far too much swearing in it, which was quite amusing considering they did allow me to watch Eddie Murphy's stand-up show Raw. The other film I wasn't allowed to watch was the British movie Scum, which was the first ever film that Ray Winston appeared in, which is a very, very gritty and realistic depiction of life in a young offenders institute or Borstal. And they wouldn't let me watch that because apparently it was far too violent which was amusing considering I was allowed to watch Robocop which contains a scene where a man drives a van into a vat of toxic waste which proceeds to melt and dissolve his skin right before a car hits him and he literally blows up. My parents were fucking weird. Number 11. The first ever record that I bought was a 7 inch vinyl single version of Twisted Sisters We're Not Gonna Take It when I was six years old in 1985. I was a weird child. Number 12. In fact, between the ages of six to 10 or 11 years old, my favorite musical acts were George Michael, Elvis Presley, Jackie Wilson, Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. Prince, and believe it or not, Eric B and Rakim. Number 13, you may laugh at that last one, but believe it or not, at the age of nine, I knew all of the words to follow the leader by Eric B and Rakim, and I can assure you, that was something that made my mother and father extremely proud. Number 14, as you can probably tell from the fact that I listened to really, really old music and was into things like animation, I was a bit of a lonely child. In fact, I didn't fit in anywhere at school with any group. I was not nerdy enough to be a nerd, I wasn't smart enough to be a boffin, and I definitely wasn't cool enough or handsome enough or good enough at sports to be a jock or a cool kid. So I was quite the loner from day one at school, but I never used to really bother me because at the end of the day I used to think, who the fuck wants to be friend with any of these cunts at school? Number 15. I was picked on and bullied mercilessly at both primary and secondary school, and 99% of this bullying tended to centre around the fact that I have this big giant brown mole on my face. See, unfortunately, this was the 1980s, long before multiculturalism and political correctness had even really caught on or had even been heard of. So unfortunately for me, everyone at the school I went to was white, and as a result of that, this made me the closest thing to an easily victimizable ethnic minority that they had. In fact, some shithead at school, who I genuinely hope since then has fallen feet first into a threshing machine, started a very, very malicious rumour that the reason I had this patch of brown skin on my face was because I was biracial. I was the product of a mixed relationship between a black and a white parent. However, unlike all those other people who come from mixed backgrounds, rather than having both black and white evenly distributed throughout my body, apparently all of my blackness was condensed down into this handy cheek-sized accessory or attachment. 
This led to me, at the age of seven years old, getting the shit kicked out of me by five other lads who were also seven years old after school one day, in what I'm pretty sure is the only ever example of a white-on-white -white racial hate crime. Number 16, my taste for music from the 50s and 60s came mainly from the fact that I used to spend my weekends alone listening to all of my parents' old records and tapes. Number 17, one Saturday afternoon I came across an album that little did I know at the time would literally change my entire life. It wasn't a musical album or anything by any pop star or recording artist. This record was a live recording of a stand-up comedy set called Get Into Them by a guy who I'd never heard of called Billy Connolly. The record cover was enough to cause me to laugh hysterically for about an hour as it contained this very hairy man wearing a black leotard with boots on that were shaped like bananas. Then I played the record and I spent literally the entire weekend playing it over and over pissing myself with fucking laughter. Now the audio quality wasn't great and given that I was nine years old there was a lot of things he talked about that I didn't really understand but that didn't matter because he had a very funny voice and he used to swear a lot and at the end of the day when you're a nine-year-old boy that's pretty much all you need. In fact to this day one of the funniest fucking swearing expressions I've ever heard in my entire life and will ever hear is Billy Connolly in a stand-up routine about going to the toilet on a train when he talks about the wee beige jobby. To my delight, my parents had two other albums by him, so I then listened to them as well, to the point where I had literally, to the point where after a few days I had literally memorised every single line out of every routine that he had done, and I used to mime along to it in my room, just like you would when you were listening to a fucking pop song. And it was around about this time that I said to myself, this is what I want to do when I grow up. Number 18. However, that wasn't the first time I'd heard a stand-up routine that wasn't exactly appropriate for someone of my age. At the age of eight, I went on a fishing holiday with my dad. One of the guys there had a video cassette of a live recording of a guy called Roy Chubby Brown. If you're not familiar with Roy Chubby Brown, you look him up. However, I never forget the moment when I heard the first rude joke that I'd ever heard, which was Roy Chubby Brown going, There you are, what you eat. That's why I'm a cunt. Number 19. Whilst I understand that these days Roy Chubby Brown's stand-up routine is extraordinarily problematic as a motherfucker, I will, however, always have a soft spot in my heart for Roy Chubby Brown. Back in 1996, I had just started going to college to learn to train how to be a chef. And there was this guy in my class, this ignorant little fucking prick who went by the name of Chris, I won't give you his full fucking name, but he used to constantly fucking pick on me and fucking make fun of me and I never ever said anything back because I never did, I never stood up for myself, I always just fucking took it. Until one morning when for some reason, I don't know if I'd just literally been pushed over the edge, I decided I wasn't going to take this shit anymore and I decided to say something back. Now bear in mind that back then I was about 5 foot 2 and I weighed about 150 pounds so I was a chunky little fucker to put it mildly. Anyway, one morning all of us were all getting changed in the men's changing room and upon taking my shirt off, Chris decided to turn around and for no reason said to me, he said, hey Richard, why are you so fucking fat? And I don't know why but the thing that popped into my head was a joke that Roy Chubby Brown once said, which I responded with saying, because every time I fucked your mum she made me a cake. Now normally this would have led to me getting a couple of stiff punches upside the head, however on this occasion that didn't happen because all the other boys in the changing room immediately started pissing themselves and pointing and laughing at this guy who just grabbed his stuff and literally stormed out saying nothing. And he never ever said a fucking thing to me ever again. And finally number 20, that was also pretty much the final time anybody ever made fun of my weight because within the first year of me joining college, I went from being 5 foot 2 and about 150 pounds at the start to about 9-10 months later being 5 foot 10 and 125 pounds. And I'm pretty sure I'm the only person ever to train to be a chef and actually end up losing 25 pounds within the first year. But as they say, cocaine is a hell of a drug. 
Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brother Neuro. Please consider subscribing to this channel. Let me know what you think down below. And feel free to post some facts about yourself. And let me, I just, I'm not going to care or read them because I don't give a shit. But let me just put it on and feign interest for a while. If you want to help and support what I do on YouTube and on, and on my podcast as well, please go and donate to my Patreon. It, it would mean a great deal to me. Or you can make a donation on PayPal or go to my merchandise shop and buy something there. I've also got another channel called Insane Rap Bloke, which I'll also link below. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. My name's Dick Coughlin. Good night. May God be less. Thank you.